gun. You can't fight in here. This is the war room. Shit filters full. Really? Yeah. I always go backwards when I'm backing up. What are you under? Yeah, he's got to do something for a living these days. Diane ain't much of a living boy. You failed to maintain your weapon, son. It's liberty! It, it's her! Whiskey, quick. Master, we are here. But what I do have are a very particular set of skills. <laughs> <laughs> Why is mad? Something is going to happen. What's going to happen? Something wonderful. You can call it the art of fighting without fighting. We started a game we never got to finish. I was just fooling about. I wasn't. Why don't you make like a tree and get the fuck out of here? Give me liberty or give me death! <laughs> Good day, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Ernest Emerson Podcast, a podcast where both you and I get to talk with, listen to, and ask questions of some of the most interesting people in the world. We only have one disclaimer. If you are offended by the truth, please go away. Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we're here for another Ernest Emerson podcast, and I have Danny here with me today. Good morning, Danny. How are you? Good morning, Ernie. Excellent. Uh, I guess we're ready to roll. Uh, today we have a, a real real special guest, very interesting, and uh, someone who's who's been an important part of my both my life and my career, and uh, uh, known him for quite a while, actually, since basically the beginning of when I started to uh, do what I do, which is make knives. And as many of you know, I, I am a custom knife maker, and I also own a, a knife company, Emerson Knives Incorporated. And, you know, it, it there are people in your life that uh, you know, and they can have an influence on, on the way you think or the way you do things. And uh, there's people that are in your life at times that uh, not only have that kind of an influence, but can actually influence your entire future and your career. And the gentleman that we have with us today is one of those people. He certainly uh, influenced my career and gave me, uh, I guess, some horsepower behind what I ended up doing and, and some notoriety and some, some, just some really good vibes along the way. And uh, he's my friend, and he is the friend to all knife makers, uh, Mr. Steve Shackelford. He is the editor of Blade Magazine. And Steve, welcome to the show. Well, that's nice to be here. Thank you for the uh, fantastic introduction. I, I, I'm humbled by that. Well, Steve, it's, it's, it's easy to say those things when they're all true, so that's, that's an important thing. And I, I, you really have been a, a great influence on my career, and as as on so many other knife makers, I'm sure. So, well, we're going to talk about some knives today. But uh, first thing I want to do is just find out a little bit about you, Steve, so that uh, you know you're you're at the shows. You talk to a lot of knife makers. You talk to a lot of the people that are at the shows, and uh, you're the the name on the on the masthead at the magazine. But uh, I I think a lot of people really. They know you kind of in that regard, but let's find out just a little bit about who you are, where you're from, uh, where you grew up, uh, you know, all that good stuff. So let's start out, uh, where were you born? In, in, uh, I was born in uh, Chattanooga, Tennessee in 1953, and uh, basically lived there uh, all my uh, you know, grade school year, or early life, through grade school. Waited from high school or went to uh, East Ridge High School and Notre Dame High School in Chattanooga. And uh, uh, from there, I, I joined the Navy in, uh, what, 1971, was in there for four years, <laughs> and uh, got out, went to school at the uh, University of uh, Tennessee, Knoxville, got my degree in journalism, and journeyed out into the wild and uh, crazy world of uh, uh, of our time. Well, I see some uh, notes that you got over to me uh, that uh, 
when you were in the Navy, uh, you, you were a radio man? Is that what it was? Or Yes. Yes, I went to radio in a school in Bainbridge, Maryland. And uh, actually, I was in the last class that learned more, lear- learned how to take Morse code. No kidding. Uh, and uh, But I never used it. And then, <laughs> I mean, I was in, in the Navy. They, uh, okay, hold on a second. I could take 10. Hold on a Go second. What did I just say? <laughs> <laughs> Can you still remember any of it, Steve? What, of the Morse code? Yeah. Actually, uh, they say, I remember when I went to uh, a school, they said it'd be like riding a bicycle, but you'd never forget it. I don't really do it anymore, but something tells me if I just got down and started doing the did it all dits and all that yep. stuff, that it would it would probably come back pretty quick. I could take ten words a minute, oh, and, wow. uh, which was you know it was a decent, decent amount, and uh, but I always found it kind of ironic that. Uh, you know, I never used it. The only reason I went there is because in uh, boot camp that you know we every day in Orlando we'd go to these classes and they'd test us mm-hmm. for things that we could do. And they had this one class where you identified sound, oh. and I apparently did really good on that. And the powers that be figured, hey, this guy would make a good radio man because he could take Morse code, <laughs> which I never it. took, never used the whole time I was in the, <laughs> in the service, but. Uh, uh, I was really lucky because I remember in boot camp there were a number of guys who thought they were going to be getting schools or or mm-hmm. something, and they were assigned directly to ships. Yeah, and those guys were so upset I couldn't. It, it just amazed me. But uh, <laughs> you, I, I don't know if you've ever heard that before, but uh, I think that was probably something that happened commonly. I guess to, to guys who went in thinking they were going to get certain schools or whatever and didn't well it's funny a lot of guys you know you join the navy and they didn't want to be on a ship and and i got it i understand that (laughs) but it's the navy (laughs) (laughs) what are you thinking (laughs) but uh it's interesting too that the morse code uh i've always been fascinated i've never learned it but you know you see all those movies where uh communication breaks down and you know the only thing you can do is is tap something out on a, on on a primitive uh, uh, what do you call it the what was the 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 uh, little machine? It, it was I, they just it was just a key, machine. a yeah. telegraph key type telegraph, thing that you it. would yeah tell it, yeah. That's pretty cool. So who knows? You know, stuff like that. Uh, sometimes, you know, I, what was that movie that way uh, about the UFOs, the the aliens that came to Earth and they were going to destroy the Earth? Uh, they were like locusts and all that. Danny, do you remember that one? Independence Day, uh, and they destroyed. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, they destroyed all our satellites, and then the only way they could communicate uh, was by Morse code. You really? I've forgotten. It was. I just we just watched that the other day. I must have missed that part. Yeah, I didn't watch it all the way through, but we love that movie. We yeah. watch it all the time. I'm a big alien and UFO guy. Uh, yeah, just love the science fiction movies and all that. But anyway, so uh, you got out of uh, the Navy. And uh, what was your what was your avocation uh, after that? Were you did you pick anything out or? I really it was uh, you know all the way I wanted to be a journalist, uh, mm-hmm. but I said well, I guess you're thinking more what of a hobby? Is that no uh, no what just whatever? Oh okay yeah I basically I had wanted to be a journalist since I was a kid. I, uh, I had uh, been a paper boy in the 1960s in middle school, oh, and I'd yeah. read the paper. In fact, that's how basically how I learned how to read was looking at the sports page and looking at the uh, <laughs> standings and uh, the baseball standings during baseball season. Yep, yep. And uh, bringing back and a I lot just, of I got, Yeah, I, I, I just got into uh, sports, and uh, when I was a paper boy, uh, I, there was a local writer named Jay Searcy who went on to. Uh, right for the Philadelphia Inquirer, mm-hmm. and there was also with the syndicated columnist named Jim Murray. I'm sure you remember him oh, with yeah. the L.A. Times. Absolutely. And he just fascinated me the way he wrote. He uh, he wrote in a, uh, he made just kind of like a little short one line wisecracks about mm-hmm. stuff, mm-hmm. and I just loved his style. And I I just told myself I was going to be a sports writer someday, which did not work out exactly the way I thought it was, but I did. You know, get into. Uh, I wanted to be a writer. I tried to be change my rate while I was in the Navy, mm-hmm. but they, it was just they had spent too much money on me to make me a radio. 
So I, and I, I, I your ears were that. too good. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and uh, but uh, you know I. Uh, uh, but when I got out of the Navy, I decided, well, I'm going to go to school and learn how to, you know, how to write, mm-hmm. be a, a journalist. And, uh, of course, I went to UT Knoxville, and uh, uh, I did a lot of stringing jobs there. I worked for the Oak Ridge newspaper. I'd go to local college or high school basketball games, mm-hmm. which was a trip, going to all those little oh, backwater yeah. Tennessee high school gymnasiums. <laughs> Uh, but it was I loved it. And, oh God! Uh, yeah, I got into it and got and when I graduated, I figured, well, heck, I'll uh, you know get a job in newspaper, and it wasn't quite as easy as I thought it was going to be. I worked uh, what a chat the Chatsworth Times in Chatsworth, Georgia, for all of one hundred and twenty five dollars a week, <laughs> and uh, that that lasted two weeks until I saw another position at the Catoosa County News in Ringo, Georgia, for a whopping $182 a week. Wow, that's a step so up. So I figured, yeah, I figured, what the heck, I'll try that. And I, I worked there for about two or three experience. Uh, I got to do, I did everything, sports, news. I covered Kiwanis. I go out and shoot the biggest pumpkins in the at the local farms, the biggest squashes. And we'd run them in the newspaper, you know, it's just the old country rude stuff that was really entertaining. Oh, yeah. But, uh, but well, uh, that that was a great experience. And that's cool because I, I'm a I'm from the country myself, and and uh, I lived in that kind of environment. And uh, you know, that's that's Americana. That that's the 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 blood that flows through our veins. Uh, you know, the small towns, the parades. That you know, when you have a Fourth of July parade or something, the whole freaking town turns out with all the little ones and the granddads <laughs> yeah. in the wheelchairs and all that. Uh, you know, you were you were right in the middle of it, and, and it's even I think more prevalent down there in in the South, where there's a, a real sense of community for people that live in those small those small towns. And that's a good thing. Yeah, definitely. So what? How did you ever end up? Uh, was there a Blade magazine, or I, w- take me through yeah. that road? That basically, I uh, left the Catoosa County News, got another job, didn't last very long, and I was painting houses. Back to what I had done to, to kind of get me through uh, college, mm-hmm. and uh, I, I kept my eye out. I went to the Tennessee Employment uh, Security Agency, and would you know say from time to time, say if you hear of any kind of writing job, let me know. And I went there one time, and the guy said. Well, we know of one, but it's not going to be available for a couple of weeks. But you can go contact this guy and ask him about it. And I said, well, okay. So I, the guy's name was Bruce Foles, who was um, oh, yeah. uh, b- 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 co-publisher and editor of Blade. I called him, and he was going, how did you know about this job? I said, well, I can't tell you. This guy told, swore me to secrecy. But, uh, <laughs> and, and, and he said, okay. Well, I went in and interviewed, and... Uh, I guess Bruce saw, liked what he saw, and that was uh, what August of 1985. And he wanted me to edit Edges, which was like a uh, tabloid knife paper mm-hmm. to, that was uh, Blade's sister publication. Okay. It never really did much, but at the same time, he wanted me to help with Blade, which I did, and he made me managing editor, uh, and that was in 1985, and I've been there ever since. Of course, the magazine was established in 1973 and started by Blackie Collins. Oh, yeah, and, um, famous knife maker. And, yes, and Bruce had been been with Blade, I think, since 1980 or 81 when uh, Jim Parker bought it. And Parker. I think Bruce went in, yeah, Jim Parker of Parker Cutlery. Parker Cutlery, yeah. And he had uh, uh, he bought it, and Bruce borrowed the money from Jim to go in half seas on the the magazine. Mm-hmm. So uh, you know, Bruce was like co owner uh, until like 1986 when he bought it outright mm-hmm. from uh, bought Jim Parker out, and that's when Blade went on national newsstands. It was the only uh, national newsstand knife publication mm-hmm. at at the time, and it kind of just took off from there uh, of course he and parker had started the blade show in 1981 the uh, uh blade magazine hall of fame the blade magazine knife of the year awards and all of that and uh we have just carried it on ever since then uh and it's of course now the blade show is the biggest knife show in the world and oh yeah we like to think that blade magazine is the world's number one knife publication 
okay. well, or a publication, which is what we put on the masthead. So. <laughs> I got to agree with that. Uh, you know, it's it's funny because I would have to say, you know, not not being in there from the beginning. In other words, uh, the the magazines and 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 your guys, all that. Uh, I I st- I made my first knife in 1979, but as a custom knife maker, it uh, it was in the late 80s that I really said, you know, I'm going to be a knife maker. So I, I wasn't in there on the ground floor with the, but I was getting the magazine, uh, you know, which kind of yeah. cool. gave, gave me a push and all that. But I got to say, uh, I think Blade Magazine uh, created the custom knife uh, market. Uh, I don't think if, if there had not been a Blade Magazine, there wouldn't be a Blade show. There wouldn't be, uh, I don't know, do you know how many thousand custom knife makers there are in the world now? I don't know. We've talked about that before, and I've I've heard any, people say anywhere four to six thousand, but that seems low to me. That's so, low. Yeah, I, I don't really. Of course, whether they those would be, you know, most of those would be part time. I don't think a lot of people are full time knife makers because mm-hmm. they, they simply can't make a living at it. Roger that. But 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 back to that, uh, blade created the ability or the I, I guess the opportunity for people to actually make a living making custom knives i mean think about it yes a a custom or a person who is interested in knives who's not a knife maker that's that's the reason there's custom knife makers i mean we all enjoy making what we do and and again don't get me wrong i mean a lot of people do it because it's the love of their life it it is mine uh but you still got to make some money on it or else uh, you end up with a whole garage full of (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> of handmade knives. <laughs> and without Blade uh, being out there, uh, you know, making people aware that there are these beautiful pieces of work that these guys do, uh, I don't think the custom knife market, I, I don't think there'd be custom knives today. I mean, maybe. Well, you, you, you're probably right, because especially early on when it first started, because people just they had no idea that there was such a thing as a, a knife industry or, or customizing blade came along and publicized that fact and it was the number one name and as far as uh, you know getting the, the word out about knives of course that's changing now with the internet and everything mm-hmm. but still people you know come or want to be on the cover of blade magazine oh, they come yeah. up to me all the time going yeah, i want to be on the cover oh, Put me, how do i get on the cover well i'll uh, tell you the uh the, well, the highlight really of of my entire knife making career was when I got my first article when I got my first article in Blade magazine and it's one of those things that's framed it's on our wall and it, it will always be <laughs> cool. and, and you know I, what can I say it was it, it's like uh, I don't know it, it's the it's the hallmark stamp that you are somebody uh, that you know that it, it, it was just a huge thing it was a big boon for my career uh, you know, there's there's no way of getting around that. It was it was what put my my name and my face in front of a whole lot of people. So. I, yeah, I get a kick out of that myself because I've got a bunch of old images sitting around the office, and every once in a while I run across <laughs> them. Those images from that first profile we did of you, and you have oh, your God. I think you had like a leather apron on in your <laughs> shop, and and you're just working away, and uh, and of course the knives that you made then I think you had more like anodized uh, anodized models, didn't more you? More fancy when they were yeah. Yeah, fancier stuff, and they were good-looking knives. I mean, but uh, well, thanks. That, that, it's fascinating to to see, go back and see the, all the uh, people that have come up over the years and see those images and and all that. It's really yeah. Uh, well, you started. When did you say you started at Blade eighty five or eighty five? Eighty five. Yes. So yeah. my math that's fifteen plus eighteen is what thirty three years. Thirty three. Yep, thirty three years. Wow. Well, things have <laughs> things have really. Uh, it's been a roller coaster ride in the knife in the knife making world because uh, things have changed now with the internet and all that. But I got to tell you, when you said that about the knife, not knowing about custom knives or custom knife makers or a knife industry, I went to a. I mean, I, I was always a, a just like any other kid from the country. You always had a jack knife. I remember mine was it was called a Barlow knife. The first one my grandfather mm-hmm. gave to me. Uh, and it was funny because he said, "Don't don't tell your grandma." <laughs> I was eight years old, I think. But anyway, uh, you know, growing up, being in the in the north woods of Wisconsin, uh, you, a knife was a part of your everyday 
you, you just had it. The kids had them at school. You had them for sharpening pencils and whatever kids do, carving your name in a tree, uh, anything. And then getting to the age where I started hunting and all that, of course, you had hunting knives and all that. But uh, I was always interested in them. And, of course, uh, you know, Blade has been really big uh, in, I guess, uh, perpetuating the story and history of the, of the Bowie knife. And you guys have run a number, a number, number, number of articles on on the Bowie knives and the history. And James Black, who is the, I guess, the guy who was supposed to have built the first one for, for whoever and all that. But, you know, I liked Bowie knives, and the first knife that I wanted to, to make, I think I made it out of wood, was was a Bowie knife. And uh, I was probably 15, 16 years old just to have something. I, I think I saw Iron Mistress or whatever that. Yeah. Isn't that the movie with Alan Ladd in it? Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, back to the whole thing. When you said didn't know about it, that you know people didn't know about uh, knife making and all that. You know, I was t- twenty plus years old and went to uh, a big gun show out here in California and walked into this one area and uh, it was the knife makers uh, section. And I, I think Mel Pardue and, and Michael Walker and, uh, and some of the other guys that that actually lived out here in California were probably there also, uh, but. I, I ask. I remember asking Mel Pardue. I said, "What's a you know, what are these? Well, these are handmade knives." And I said, "Well, do you make them?" And he goes, "Of course I do." <laughs> and I said, "Well, is I, I was I I didn't even know what to ask him because it was like, what guys actually make knives? You got to be kidding me." And then I asked him, "Is this what you do?" And he goes, "This is what I do. I make knives for a living." And I had no idea. That, that 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 thing even existed and and I think I actually walked home that day I had that one book by uh I think it's called knives and knife makers uh, and uh I bought it there was that the Sid, Sid Latham book yeah that, the Sid that, Latham the, book that's what it yeah, was yeah okay yeah and yeah. then I, I I actually picked up my first blade magazine at that knife show there was somebody there who had some of the magazines and I went home and I mean I wore the pages wow. out <laughs> <laughs> and lo and behold here we are yeah. so this is very cool now you have because of who you are and what you do you've seen and known the the icons in the industry the guys you mentioned blackie collins i mean for gosh sakes uh you know he's one of the innovators and and, and you know shakers and movers that was in the industry but uh, you you had a chance to meet a lot of the guys that i never got a chance to meet uh just because you're you're in that you're in that circle but uh i mean you knew bob loveless and uh, you know let's let's run through a few of those guys that come to mind okay sure well you want to start with loveless or yeah anybody go ahead okay yeah loveless i, I went to his shop in 1999 and uh, got to interview him and the, he was just one of the. Uh, uh, a lot of people thought he was uh, a curmud, curmudgeonly old guy. Was very, uh, you know, standoffish. Uh, or used some salty language, and which he did. And uh, but uh, he was really well read uh, and a, a, a extremely inter- interesting person to talk to. Mm-hmm. When you talk to him, it was all about a lot more than that. It was about hunting and design he was even into the design of blade magazine because he wrote for blade oh, really? early on yeah he wrote a lot of stuff for blade and he also uh was into the design of the magazine he always complained in fact one thing he complained about to me was that the magazine uh, around that time was too busy he liked it real clean and with you know uh, concise borders mm-hmm. and and all this stuff, and uh, but he, he was just a a really uh, a very intelligent person. He was a huge movie fan. He loved the movie Shane. Mm. With uh, speaking of Alan Ladd, yeah, but that that was one of his favorite movies, and one of his favorite uh, characters in the movie was the character of Wilson, played by Jack Palance. Oh yeah, and he he was a huge Jack Palance fan, <laughs> and uh, I was too. Yeah, which I, yeah, I was too. To be honest, but. <laughs> But uh, uh, he, he just, in fact, I think he met him a few times, and they, well, they became be... uh, friends. And uh, but uh, Loveless was just uh, a, a so intelligent, but a charming guy actually, where he could 
charm your socks off one minute and then cuss you like a sailor the next. <laughs> And in fact, in that interview that we did in Blade, uh, I called it a, a, a. The title was "A Pirate Looks at 70. It was a, after kind of a pattern after the Jimmy Buffett song uh, mm-hmm. a "Pirate Looks at 40. But Bob was se- actually Bob was seventy one at the time. Mm-hmm. But um, but uh, in the interview itself, I had to bleep a lot of words. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I and I put the bleeps in the print, you know, when he when every time he cussed, yeah. And there were bleeps all through that thing, and I think he was he was uh, upset with me about that. But <laughs> you know, I figured what the heck, everybody expected that from Loveless, so I don't think you know was, <laughs> there was there was, was more deal, uh, but... more redacted <laughs> stuff than a Department of Justice uh, memo. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> There you go. But, you know, it's uh, funny because when you say he liked the clean borders, not look at his designs. Uh, you couldn't get much cleaner. Yes. I, yeah. I, and again, I think a lot of guys miss it sometimes. Is simple is really the best. And I, you know, with all due respect to Bob Lullis, definitely his knives were. I mean, I'm saying this with with <laughs> great great praise. They were simple, but they were so simple that they were elegant. Yes. Yes. I mean, you remember J.W. Denton, don't you? Ernest? Yes, so, I do. Uh, mm-hmm. He sold the Loveless knives. He always compared them to sports cars. He said oh, they yeah. looked to me, looked to him like a Ferrari. Or if you yep. looked at it from the side, the the handles would look kind of like the the rear end of the Ferrari. And, mm-hmm. you know, and he said the the really classic knives reminded him of sports cars. And Loveless, of course, he thought was was the best. But, uh, well. He's he's right about that because if you look at what Bob Loveless, I mean, personally, again, my, my my small window on the knife world as a custom maker, I would say that he was probably the greatest influence on the knife designs for almost every yeah. knife maker that's out there. Everybody I made a, a Loveless Drop Point Hunter, and yep. you know what can you say about that? It's because it was such a good design. Yes. In fact, I was uh, A. G. Russell before A. G. passed away here recently. Who was a big oh, uh, contemporary yeah. of Bob's, but uh, he talked about Bob, and he said he did, he, I, he told me one time that Lovelace was not the best knife maker, but he was the best designer. And, well, uh, yeah, I'd say there's a lot to that. A. G. knows <laughs> he knows his knives That's for damn sure. <laughs> That's for uh, sure. You yeah. know, yeah. I got a short Bob Lovelace story. I, I. Uh, when I first moved out here, I lived. Uh, this was before I was making knives and all that. I was just a, a, a young kid going around painting houses, actually, just like you were trying to make a living. You know, put food on the table. I lived in a in the city of Lawndale, California, and uh, I, I had no idea. But when we when I became a knife maker and then found out about Bob and, and read about him in Blade and all that, uh, he lived about four houses down from where I lived really? in Lawndale, California. And I was like, oh, damn. <laughs> if I had only been able to walk down there and said, what are you doing? <laughs> what do you do here oh, in this yeah. garage? But, yeah, I was there, uh, you know, same city, just about four houses down from the address where uh, where he had his original shop, I guess, in Lawndale. So. Wow. Wow. So the, you know, speaking of AG uh, again, uh, he just passed away. That that's a, a sad, sad thing for the for the knife uh, community. Uh, again, a guy who, gosh, uh, I mean, he, our booth was next to AG for about the last ten years down at Blade. So we, oh, that's right, I forgot yeah. about that. And, and I knew him, you know, because of of who he was. I was used to get his uh, his periodicals, the the, mag- the catalogs and all that. But another guy who was who was, you know, can you talk a little bit about AG and what his influence was on the? Oh, on, I, I don't know that I could do him justice, but I'll I'll try. <laughs> he definitely uh, uh, was basically without him, there would not have been a knife makers, the number one knife makers organization, as you well know. You were a member, and yeah. uh, I, are you still a member? Or are you? Are you, you know, I haven't had time, so my I've probably lapsed. But uh, yeah. it, w- what you, you cut out for just a second, Steve? That's the knife makers guild that Steve is talking about, and AG was uh, one of the. He, the, the, he basically the started it because the, uh, uh, in 19, I believe it was 1970 or 71, 
he had he knew all these knife makers and and he uh, rented a bunch of tables at a show. I think it was at the at the Sahara in mm-hmm. Las Vegas, and uh, said, "All right, let's just have a knife show." And uh, you know, he got about eleven or twelve guys to uh, to uh, you know do the show. It was in conjunction with the gun show, mm-hmm. and from there they they all started talking. In fact, he I was I found out here recently that it was. Basically, uh, him, A.G., Bob Loveless, and Dan Dennehy oh, that wow. were really, the, yeah, the big, the ones that really were trying to organize it, trying to get everybody to mm-hmm. come set up at the show. And, uh, of course, they, 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 it wasn't, within, I think the following year, they all got together and decided to uh, start the Guild. And that. from, yeah, from there, it, it blossomed into the number one knife show. Of course, it's, now it's the IC. Uh, it's gone in conjunction with the ABS. It's not what it used to be, of course, but for of decades, it, it was the show, the number one custom knife show, of course. And mm-hmm. AG was the man that uh, you know was really the genius behind the the guild. When when and when you get right down to it, but uh, well, he the, just did so many things. He mm-hmm. had a uh, uh, what a mail order knife business with over. Uh, he told me one time he had over a million names in it. Of course, oh, wow. if they had not been purged. You know, they didn't purge names, so people who had died were still in there. And uh, but but he but he sold knives to all kinds of people. He uh, one of his customers was the band leader Artie Shaw. I don't know. Oh yeah. If, yeah, from the uh, from the forties. My dad was 40. a musician. Yeah. Ah, okay. There you go. <laughs> so, but he just sold knives all over the world, and uh, he he just treated everybody so great. Uh, well, it didn't matter who it was. Somebody would come up to him and say, "You know, I, what is this knife? Can you tell me something about it?" And AG would just spend forever with him. He was, you know, he was uh, he was un- irreplaceable. When basically. you when you say the words uh, uh, "southern gentleman," uh, his name's right up there on the top of the list. Yes, most definitely. Yeah. Although it was funny because you when you talked when I talked to him, <laughs> the five. Uh, placement to me. I, he didn't sound southern or anything. And I, there's another thing I found out here recently that he lived all over the world. Apparently, his dad was in the army. Well, and in fact, his dad was in the uh, Bataan Death March. Oh my gosh, I didn't know that. Yeah, I, I just found that out here recently too. And huh. uh, in fact, I, I went down there. Uh, they had a memorial type service for it was more of a, a celebration of his life it wasn't yeah. his funeral mm-hmm. but i went down here a couple of weeks ago and got to speak and uh, met saw some people jerry fisk was there spencer frazier of sog specialty knives and tools yeah. and yeah. doug flag of crkt and mm-hmm. some other people and it was it was really neat to to see them all and you won't believe this ernie but ag has got a brother looks just like him oh really yeah, he's about ten years younger, uh-huh. and he sounds like him. He's got wore the glasses like AG had, and it's kind of eerie. But uh, <laughs> but it was, it was neat. <laughs> it was neat uh, meeting them all. And but uh-huh. you're right, AG. His influence uh, on the knife business is just vast. It, it's sharpening custom knives, factory knives. Uh, he actually basically made. <laughs> It was his idea to, for the first commemorative knife, the Springfield rifle. Uh, I think it was oh, really? in the, uh, yeah, the uh, mid-'70s. Albert Bayer uh, of Schrade, mm-hmm. he got with him, and they made that. And that was basically the first commemorative knife. And the commemorative knife market basically sustained the knife industry yeah, for years. Yeah. So, Well, A.G. was quite a knife designer on his own. I mean, yes. You know, people that might not know that. They think that he was a, a more or less a purveyor and, and a, you know, in that regard. But a lot of the knives that he had in his uh, catalogs and all that, didn't he design a lot of those? Yes, he designed a number. In fact, uh, he won. they won three uh, Blade Magazine Knives of the Year well, for their, their, their models. Of course, his one-hand knife is just... Is, uh, to me, that is the... Uh, when I think of A.G.'s That's, knives... Uh, yeah. That's the picture that comes. Yeah, and uh, but uh, yeah, he was he was a big knife designer, and Phil Gibbs was making the knives for him, and of course Bob Dozier uh, made the or makes the Harry Morseth uh, Mm -hmm. knives for AG. So 
Yeah. Well, he must be busy because <laughs> there's a lot of those going on out there. <laughs> yeah, in fact, when I was there, uh, apparently AG, uh, like you, designed a whole lot of models that are going to be made for years to come. Mm-hmm. So that's that's going to be interesting to see what, what comes out of all that. You know, there's there's so many interesting characters in the in the knife making community. You, you mentioned Bob Dozier, another another one of those guys where you you look at him, and you think, "Damn, is this guy?" You know, I was actually kind of scared to shake his hand at, when I first met him because he's <laughs> built like a bear. And yep. uh, but again, you know, appearances and everything, another really nice guy. And and I'll tell you what, you can just tell by talking to him that that guy must work himself to the bone making knives. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and his fingers, his fingers are all broken and gnarly. I, I think that came from. I think he was, you know, he was an iron worker. Yeah. And he worked on skyscrapers in uh, in, in in New York City and and, and that kind of thing. And uh, uh, that's so that he's definitely be. got a a hard working background yeah, no uh, before he became a knife maker. Well, you know, it's another thing uh, i think also that that blade you mentioned uh, the guild ma- the guild uh, show what what is the guild show called now it's the international uh uh custom what is it Cut, international custom cutlery exposition I, I believe is the exposition exposition is what the icce stands for and they uh, are and it, go ahead they're in they're in kansas city Mm-hmm. And uh, each September, and uh, so as far as I know, they'll be having their show. You know, this upcoming year. In fact, I know they will be. They'll mm-hmm. be having the show. I don't know exactly when or where it's going to be, but I know they're going to have one. Well, the uh, just just for the people that might not know what the Knife Makers Guild is, it's it's an organization uh, that you can't just write in and join the Knife Makers Guild. Uh, there, there are some requirements, and your your work actually has to be judged by other members in the guild. Correct? Yes. Yes. And then you get to use the Knife Makers Guild, uh, you know, hallmark stamp, I guess, if you want to call it that, on your on your mm-hmm. business card and your advertising. But that that really was the uh, the hallmark uh, that you are a, a made man in the, in the knife making community, right? Yes, most definitely. And what you had, the probationary membership, and yep. when you first started, you had to serve it for two years, and then you became a voting member, as, as you well know. Mm-hmm. And uh, But, uh, yes, it was – in fact, of course, there still is a guild. It's just that they don't have a guild show. Mm-hmm. And uh, so – but it's uh, – now they're, they, they're combined with the ABS, the American Bladesmith Society, when they do that ICCE show. Mm-hmm. And uh, I went to the first one, uh, gosh, I guess it was five years ago, and I enjoyed it. It was held in the original place where they held the, uh, uh, I think, the first actual guild show at oh, the man. Muhlenbach Hotel, mm-hmm. or, or right by it there in Kansas City. So yeah. it was kind of a kind of a trip, kind of a you know, going down memory lane or something, yeah. although that was way before. That was even before my time. So. <laughs> that goes back a ways. <laughs> you know, you mentioned the ABS, and uh, people might not know what the ABS is. And uh, in the knife making world, uh, there are the guys like me who who get a sheet of steel and cut a. You know, I don't do it so much anymore, but uh, it was hacksaw or or a metal cutting bandsaw and you actually cut the pattern of the blade out of the steel and then worked it and ground it uh, to end up with a finished knife but the bladesmiths are the guys who stand there with the uh, with the anvil and the and the hammer and, and they make those blades uh, the the old school way right yes they they heat the steel up and forge it to shape and not a whole lot of grinding, although there is grinding. I, I mm-hmm. should not say that, but uh, they basically the shape of the blade is is hammered in, and of course Bill Moran was uh, like the Bob Loveless there of the ABS. Go. Of course, I, I shouldn't say that because that will hack off some of the ABS guys if I said that. <laughs> <laughs> but, well, but, we, uh, you know. <laughs> In this in this day and age, everything you say is going to make somebody mad. <laughs> this is true. This is true. Of course, Bill's the one who who popular basically reintroduced the Damascus steel, and that is what that was in 1973, I believe, or 73 or 74. Mm-hmm. I think it was 74. And uh, when he introduced it, and that just 
galvanized the knife world. Nobody, everybody was going, I've got to have a, a knife of Damascus steel. And he was oh, charging yeah. like $100 an inch, they said, and, yeah. and all that for the, the blades. Uh, the knife would be, you know, if it was an eight inch blade, it'd be eight hundred dollars, which back then was a fortune. And, yeah, but uh, you know what? I, I people really don't understand the work involved in doing that. I mean, that's that's grueling labor. It is being a. Of course, he came up with it, and it, you know, Damascus steel had been around long before. It just the the art had kind of disappeared from from at least from the United States, and. Uh, he brought it back, and that basically was the uh, inspiration behind the ABS, which he formed in 1976, a couple of years later. Mm-hmm. And, uh, of course, B.R. Hughes and Don Hastings and Bill Bagwell. Bill's still alive, and, of course, B.R.'s oh, yeah. still alive. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, Bill passed away, I think it was oh, 2006, I believe. But uh, it's uh, ABS is as strong as ever. And, in fact, with the Forged in Fire TV show, membership is way up oh, that's at, at record levels. Yes, the, that's the best thing about Forged in Fire is that it has brought knife making to so many people all, all over the United States and, I guess, the world. I, that show's probably watched everywhere. Well, it, it is. And, I, you know, I've watched it enough times myself uh, to, to actually go, damn, I should have I got an anvil in it. <laughs> <laughs> in a forge, <laughs> but man, I'm, I'm a little past that. that. My, I, I'm I'm pretty broken down and beat up. I, my wrist and everything, and my shoulders are so shot that I it's tough for me to pick up a a ball peen hammer anymore. To, or I mean, a regular claw hammer to nail nail a board. That's what gets that's what gets me about that show because they'll they'll have people on there, guys on there who are kind of old, you know, our age, or, <laughs> well, our age, up around sixty, and that's not fair. Those old guys get in there, and those young guys just smoke them and. You know, some of those old guys are great knife makers, but Heck when yeah. you put them under the gun like that, under those hot lights, yeah, that's the, not that's not really time fair. Thing too, but yeah. but you know, what the heck? No, I'll tell you, it's 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 amazing uh, what that show has done. Uh, I mean, for gosh sakes, uh, it, it's people love that stuff. I mean, it, you know, the thing about it is uh, when you think back in time, you know, and you and I have talked about this in the past. Uh, every everything that we we did as a leap into modern uh, civilization uh, had to do with blacksmiths. Uh, they built everything. Uh, you know, up until the 1940s and 50s, there, you know, guys were still, you know, making parts for, for tractors and, and wagons and everything else. And, you know, weapons was a huge part of what blacksmiths did over the years. Yes. I mean, over the, over the millennia. Yes. Uh, and, you know, that's, that's again, you know, and I, I'm sure it's of course it is all over the world but you know that again you know under the under the uh what is that under the spreading chestnut tree the village smithy stands i mean it, again it's it's part of americana for sure you know yes and uh now it, it's funny too because uh i think that there's i think that this show has probably excited uh a lot of uh female uh, uh smiths to come to to join that I, community, right? I agree. Yeah, I, I think you're right. I, I've seen at least one on, on there, and I think she won. In fact, but I don't know what her name was. But mm-hmm. uh, you're right. It's it's just ideal for getting women involved, and uh, the uh, potential for that is they just continue to to push the the bar. I, mm-hmm. uh, in fact, I, this past weekend I watched it and it was really good because I knew three of the four Smiths on there. And when oh, you know man. the people on there, it really makes it uh, entertaining. And it was Billy Bob's uh, soul. He's an, uh, mm-hmm. a, blade, a bladesmith. Uh, Dwight Phillips, he was, he's a bladesmith. And Steve Culver, another bladesmith mm-hmm. from Kansas City. And, uh, oh, it was great. And they made these, these little, huge... Uh, uh, sword, swords with like long handles mm-hmm. and like these huge curved blades. I think they called them. I can't remember exactly what the the name of it was, but man, both Billy Bob and Dwight just nailed it. Those they were, <laughs> they were cutting. They had wild hogs hanging from uh, meat hooks and mm-hmm. were cutting those things in half with them. Of course, you know they were corpses, dead dead hogs, of course. But uh, uh, but it was. They were it after was those amazing. knives got after them. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. So, uh, but it was it was really the two of the uh, best looking 
uh, fished mm -hmm. knives I had ever seen or swords. Well, that, you know, that show. these guys uh, in the knife making community, and I'm not talking. Uh, well, I'm I'm amazed at the bladesmiths because they do they do magic work, you know, compared to what what I do, but the knife making community the people that i have met and talked to and been inspired by they're some of the smartest most innovative inventors and craftsmen that i've i mean i worked in the aerospace industry i was around a lot of really smarty smarty pants engineers and guys from mit and all that crap uh mm -hmm. who, who sometimes honest all due respect, didn't know the difference between a, a flathead and a, and a Phillips screwdriver. But I'll tell you, the, the people I've met in the knife-making uh, community are some of the smartest people that I've ever met in my entire life. And I agree. I that, mean, in fact, that, that Jim Batson is a classic example. Speaking of somebody who worked, uh, he, was, he, he actually was a rocket scientist. He worked at the Redstone Arsenal in Huntsville, oh Alabama. Yeah, and uh, of course now he's. You were talking about uh, Bowie earlier. He's written his new book is out, James Bowie and the Sambar Fight, books one and two, and he goes into uh, who uh, actually the I don't know if you're familiar with the Edwin Forrest Bowie, but it, it's mm -hmm. the one that uh, uh, Bill Williamson had in his collection, and Bill had claimed it was it had belonged to Jim Bowie. Oh wow! And of course, the knife is still around, and there were some who doubted it. And uh, but Jim decided to research it, and in this book, he he basically makes the claim that that was the knife that uh, Bowie used in the Sambar fight. And uh, it's a it's a fascinating book. It's out now, mm -hmm. and uh, but he talks goes into how it was made, who made it, why he thinks it was uh, you know mm -hmm. made by this particular person, the kinds of things that led him to believe that it was made by this particular person mm -hmm. and uh it's it's a fascinating book i highly recommend it what, what's the name of the book again it, it's the the james Bowie and the sandbar fight books one and two by jim batson uh, I'm, and in I'm fact it's, to get you, to, yeah you'd have to contact basically it's it's uh uh you have to contact him mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh and, and I can get you that information later if you want it. But, well, we'll uh, put it up on the uh, we'll put it up on the uh, website after we're done and all that. Cool. So yeah, give okay. me that info. Just just email I it will. over to me. That'd be cool. I will. I will. You know, it's uh, again the, that damn Bowie knife. It, it's it is part. I mean, you you picture the American flag. You picture the Bowie knife. You picture uh, you know Davy Crockett and and. Uh, uh, Gosh, what was Davy's partner at, at the Alamo? Um, but anyway, of course, uh, Bowie was there. Yeah, Bowie was there. Travis. Travis, that's the one I was. Th well, he was the captain or, or the yeah, commander. he was the, the yeah. head head man. Yeah, so, I always think of Georgie Russell and the Walt Disney Davy Crockett played oh, by yeah. Buddy Ibsen. Oh. <laughs> well, I, you know, well, here's a funny thing because I started building these damn flintlock rifles, and I got to tell you, I'm. It goes all the way back to Walt Disney and Davy Crockett. I mean, the, the tomahawks, the the rifles, the Bowie knives. Uh, for gosh sakes, I mean, how many? I I don't know if you did, but I had a coonskin cap when I was about eight. Oh, I still I bought one here. I went to the I went to the ABS show that was held in San Antonio in about. Oh God, it was about 2012, and that I went to the Alamo, and they've got the Alamo uh, gift shop behind it, and of course. They have skid to, caps. Yeah. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it, again, that's part of our that's part of our heritage, and it, you know, it's 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 in my blood, and I'm sure it's in a bunch. Of, uh, you know, I hope it never goes away. And again, you know, Blade Magazine. I, I, one other thing I want to say about uh, the people that are knife makers, uh, they're really patriotic, um, <laughs> true, you know red white and blue americans I, again in that community uh you've got people that are i mean they support the troops they're they're just they they get involved in in a lot of uh, uh charitable organizations and and make knives for donations and auctions and all that and yeah. it, it really is a wonderful community i mean 
you know, we're, we're, we're all brothers and sisters, and we all have our, our, our moments, but uh, we, we pull together as a, as a knife-making community in the end. I think we're, we're all uh, g- glad to be part of that, under that Most umbrella. definitely. Yeah. We were talking about A.G., you know, we gave him an award back in 2004 because he was sending those uh, packages of uh, to the troops in mm-hmm. uh, the Middle East during the uh, the Gulf War, but yeah. uh, uh, or the Iraq War, I guess I should yeah. say. But uh, uh, in those in those packages, he would have like band aids and uh, tweezers mm-hmm. and. Uh, Magazines, he put blade magazines in there, oh. and he also put a copy of the U.S. Constitution oh, be. in in well, each package. Yeah, he, you talk about somebody who was a patriot. That, yeah. That's key. Well, I'm I'm proud to be a part of that community. I, I've I again, you know, people have extended. Uh, I mean, most of these guys, if you ask them a question. Better be able to get ready to sit down for an hour or so and 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 have a discussion because it, it's like <laughs> yep. that. Yes. You know they're they're excited about what they do. They're proud of it, and and they they all want more and more uh, people to take up that uh, that art. Uh, I guess you, you could yeah. call that. Because honest, there's been uh, there are guys that that you know I make I make a, a more of a, a working man's uh, tool, but there are knife makers, custom knife makers out there. And I mean, we can think of uh, I mean the, the the first one that comes to mind is that. Uh, uh, King Tut Dagger. Uh, yes. You, you remember that? T- just tell us a little, just a touch about that, because that's that's a very famous art. Yeah, that was really knife. the first blockbuster story when I was at Blade. Uh, Gary Kelly, a knife maker from Oregon, used to write for us. He was a great writer, too. And, uh, but he wrote a two-part story on how Buster Warinsky uh, made the uh, reproduction of the King Tut Dagger. And it basically... Phil Lobred uh, commissioned it. Uh, Phil, he just recently passed away. Well, mm-hmm. I guess it was last year he mm-hmm. passed away. But uh, he was, uh, of course, a big uh, uh, knife enthusiast out of oh, yeah. uh, California. And he uh, commissioned. He, tr- In fact, at first he tried to get Herman Schneider to, uh, at first to build the uh, King Tut Dagger. But mm-hmm. Herman couldn't do it. But I think it was Herman that recommended Buster. Well, and of course, Buster Warinsky is—he's one of the most famous knife makers of all time. And he—he he made the the uh, the knife. It had thirty. It has thirty-three ounces of gold in it. And, oh <laughs> yeah. and of course, that was back. Th- that was in 1988. I don't know what gold was going for then, but but you can imagine now. But uh, but yeah. uh, uh, Buster went made. All, he researched it. How the knife, the original knife, was made. And it is basically just just like the the original. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's got the a process called granulation all along the handle that apparently just took him forever to do. He'd yeah. spill the, these tiny granules all over the shop floor and have to start over. I think oh, it took him about five years to, uh, no to make make the finished knife. And it, he did it, uh, all kinds of things over and over again to get it mm-hmm. right. And uh, but yeah, that knife is basically the grail knife of of custom of, knives. I, I I think that's pretty safe to say. Yes, it is. But it, uh, it's in fact, I I just found out something the other day watching. No, speaking of our our UFO stuff, mm-hmm. the, one of these ancient alien shows that they had something about materials, mm-hmm. and they had the King Tut dagger on there. The the uh, you know the uh, real King he Tut had, dagger, yeah. and how the uh, the blade was made. From uh, a meteorite, mm-hmm. and uh, so, but they yep. date that one to like 1322 BC, which, as far as I know, would be the oldest knife made of iron that I know of. But Could uh, very well be that. Just a sidelight. I don't yeah. know. Of course, the the meteorite has all kinds of impurities in it, but you know, for a knife back then, I'm sure that was. <laughs> Well, um, that was the cat's pajamas. Yeah, yeah they, they they had those nickel iron meteorites, and they were able to pound them yes. and all that. And, and no matter the impurities, it still beats copper, right? <laughs> yes, definitely. <laughs> but if you look at that knife, the 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 uh, actual King Tut dagger, the the blade looks, uh, you know, highly refined for, you know, for uh, people that was were not making. Iron blade, of course. I guess there was bronze, and mm-hmm. and you know more about that than I do. But uh, the, the, they could pound the blade shapes, but it's really some 
Well, I think Buster's Buster's achievement was monumental. Oh, it was, and it was absolutely stunning. It's a museum, literally a museum uh, piece, if you will. Uh, yes. Well, I think it, you know since you mentioned the 1323 or whatever BC, uh, you know knives are they're like one of man's. If not, the, you know there's a there's a little bit of a debate in there. Uh, you know, between the stick and the knife, so yeah. <laughs> you know, man's oldest tool. And, uh, yes. you know, if it wasn't, if it isn't the oldest tool, it's like number two. Uh, but it's certainly, you know, probably man's most useful tool and maybe the most influential tool that uh, that man ever invented. And, uh, you know, it, it's funny, too, because you think about, uh, you know, who needs a knife you know, that kind of thing. And I, I always used to tell a story about, you know, you might not need a, a, a tactical knife or a buoy knife at your side, but I'll tell you what, uh, you go to any board meeting f- uh, from Microsoft to, wh- you know, any of the, the highfalutin people and, the, and you have 20, 30 people around the, the, the hand-carved oak tables that they have or mahogany, and you were to ask the question, hey, uh, who's got a knife in their pocket here? And I bet a good half of them probably carry something like a Swiss Army knife or, or a little, you know, they have a knife on them. And, you know, I, I don't think that the, the knife as a tool will ever, it'll never go away. It can't. That's just so useful. I agree. There are just too many uses to put it to. Plus, the ingenuity of the way knives are made nowadays, you talk about the Swiss Army knife. Right. That uh, you know, it's it's there's that to me. That's one of my great disappointments uh, in the uh, my career is is was the after nine one one when they before that the Swiss Army knife everybody carried a Swiss Army knife on planes. Oh yeah. I mean, if you that, if you're going to take a knife onto a plane, it was a Swiss Army yeah. knife. Everybody had them. You and, had your plane uh, knife. <laughs> yes, your plane knife, and it was you know to me. I know that had to just devastate uh, uh, Swiss, Army. Swiss Army knife business, and yeah. uh, but to, to this day, I, I still think they should allow Swiss Army knives on planes. That, that to me is just um, criminal. That anyhow. well, you know, unfortunately, uh, it's the old you know a few bad apples spoil the whole yep. the whole bushel, and those were those were some real bad apples that on that day <laughs> exactly. But uh, you know. It, you mentioned some of the. Uh, uh, we were talking about some of the guys that are influential. Yeah. All that uh, Michael Walker, uh, another guy, most definitely. Yeah, yeah, whose whose knife designs. If you, if you were to just draw an outline of his knife designs, again, they have that sports car, you know, mm-hmm. racing car, jet plane, you know, look to him. But uh, wasn't he one of the first guys to to really bring in some of the strange uh, alloys and do some of the exotic stuff? Well, I know he did. Uh, what the, the, used the titanium, titanium on yeah. his liner lock, mm-hmm. and uh, some of the the other uh, materials like what niobium and some of that other uh, stuff. That, uh, but to me, it hit, with him, of course, it was the liner lock that mm-hmm. uh, makes it, makes him stand out. But the anodized titanium. We were talking about that and how you used oh, yeah. it early on, yeah. but uh, his wife uh, Patricia mm-hmm. back then uh, was the one basically who uh, anodized his knives, and uh, that was you know that just really dominated that in rocked the, late the world. 80s. Man. Yeah, yes, it did. And uh, of course, Michael's knives go for seven feet or gosh, what. Uh, I'm, I can't count. More five figures, most, yes. Five yeah. figures. More I mean, than most his, people his, making it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I tell people how much money his knives go go for, and they just look at me like, get out of here. You know, You're know, you making that up. <laughs> but, yeah. But, uh, yeah, he he is just a phenomenal talent. Uh, uh, a lot of people probably, I guess, think he's the best knife maker who ever lived. But, uh well, I'm in that. I don't know. He's, I'm in that he's group. Definitely, he's, he's definitely. Oh yeah, up he, there. yeah, yeah. He's. Uh, he went. We got him in the Hall of Fame a few years back. Very uh, reserved fella. And, Smart uh, as a. Yes. Yeah. Most definitely. And of course, he and Ron Lake had that uh, uh, team there for a while, where mm-hmm. they were working together. Uh, too bad that did not last longer. Mm-hmm. 
course, Brian is a fantastic maker too, the yep, yep. maker of the the uh, tail lock mm-hmm. and his knives. When it comes to fit and finish, I don't know if anybody. Oh. Makes a better knife. Yeah. You know, these guys take this uh, to such a degree. Uh, Honest, and to people that are out there, uh, you know, going over to uh, a gun store and and looking at some of the nice knives, you mentioned SOG, there's Benchmade, there's Buck, there's Spyderco. They all make really nice knives. Don't, Don't get me wrong, but I'll tell you what, if you've never, you know, seen some of the knives that, uh, of the, from the guys that, that Steve has mentioned here today, I'm telling you, it, it's, it's on another planet. The, the the workmanship, the precision, the finish, the the beauty of these knives, and the exotic materials that they use. Uh, yes. You know, if you're if you're not a custom knife maker person, or or, or a, uh, have never gone to the to the blade show or any knife show, you, you got to get up off your rear end and get to one of these knife shows because I'll tell you what, <laughs> yeah. they are a blast, and you will see. Some, yeah, speaking of the blade yeah. show, it'll be June seven through nine at the Cobb Galleria Center again. Come to the blade show, you can see Ernest Emerson and his well. knives, <laughs> and the greatest knives in the world. Yeah, and and, and I'll tell you the the everybody who's anybody is at the blade show. Uh, it's like a big old family reunion for all the knife makers when you go down there. Uh, I'm telling you, it's. Uh, you guys have done a tremendous job. That show, uh, it, it just keeps getting better, Steve. I don't know what, I don't know what you're doing, but uh, we don't we don't do anything. We just try to stay out of everybody else's way, and if we just just let the people that come do it, and it it's it's all the exhibitors and the patrons who come to see the exhibitors and each other and show each other their knives and trade knives and. It, it's just uh, a real happening, and uh, it amazes me, too, because, uh, you know, it's nothing that basically, of course, it was Bruce Bulls and Jim Parker who started it, mm-hmm. and, of course, I, to me, Bruce is the genius behind it, because he really built it mm-hmm. early on when it in those salad years, and, uh, gosh, I think it started at a place called the... Uh, um, oh gosh, the Drawbridge Motor Inn in <laughs> since, across the river from Cincinnati in a place in Erlanger, Kentucky. Well, I'll be. And it was it was just a little hole in the wall thing. Of course, I wasn't with them then. Mm-hmm. And but the next year they moved it to Knoxville at the Holiday Inn and Convention Center. They had the World's Fair uh, in Knoxville mm-hmm. in 1982, and they had built up that Holiday Inn Convention Center, and it was actually it was a pretty nice facility. Mm-hmm. But, of course, Knoxville was just not a international hub. But it got yeah. some great turnout. We had some, some great shows there. Uh, uh, of course, we were doing the Knives of the Year and the Hall of Fame and all mm-hmm. that. But it's when we moved, uh, when Bruce moved it to Atlanta in 1992 that uh, that was the master stroke from there. Uh, we held it there in the Renaissance Ro- Waverly Hotel mm-hmm. uh, adjacent to the Cobb Galleria Center. And uh, in I believe it was 1996, Dave Kowalski, who was the publisher then, uh, after Bruce had sold the magazine and the show to Krause Publications, he moved it into the Cobb Gallery Center, and that's when it really uh, exploded. It, it exploded. Yeah, this, yeah, we kept getting bigger and bigger. In fact, now we're so big that there's no more room in there for us to expand. We had to get another uh, uh, ballroom around the corner from the existing ballrooms and it it from what i understand when i every time i went in there this past summer mm-hmm. it was gangbusters okay so yeah you just uh, you can't people if it's the blade show they're going to come no matter where it well, is and you know. that's what i always tell people too is if you're going to go to any show if you can pick one you've you got to go to the blade show because <laughs> that's where it's taking place uh I think uh, one thing we got to mention too is that it isn't, you know, we're talking about custom makers and things like that. It's everything. I mean, it's it is uh, all the knife companies that exist mm-hmm. pretty much on Earth, yep. uh, from Russia yep. to, to you know China, Japan, Germany, uh, Poland. I mean, they're all there uh, as companies mm-hmm. showing their their wares and all that. Uh, but. There's blades. Don't they have it like uh, there's a bladesmith section and the, and the. I mean, there's everything. Yeah, we have the the, the section there for the ABS. Mm-hmm. Uh, of course, the guild section. The, the, they've kind of, we've kind of scaled that back now, and there's kind of some intermingling going on there now. But, uh, of course, we have the knife making suppliers. Any kind of material you want to make oh, a knife, yeah. any mach, any machine you need to make a knife, uh, tomahawk swords. 
uh, ballet songs, uh, kitchen knives, yes, everything uh, that has to do with knives and, and stuff that cuts, other than chainsaws. I don't, I've never seen a chainsaw in there. <laughs> but, uh, I've <laughs> seen those guys that sharpen their uh, axes so sharp they can shave with them, though. Uh, yeah, definitely. And uh, they're there. Yeah, we had, we had Murray Carter in there one year shaving his head. He would. Uh, that, that was that was. I remember that. That drew a lot. And of course, your your little set. Uh, of course, you have your seminar at the show every year. Plus, uh, when you have everybody come in for the the drawing for your knife. Good lord, that's nuts. Well, that's a show within a show. So yeah, we have a lot of fun. I'll, I'll tell you, it's again only because there's blade and the, and the blade show that we're able to do that. Uh, so you know, thanks for that, Steve. Uh, so the Blade Show is in June. It's in Atlanta. Uh, it's uh, it's a great place to go, folks. Honest, if you if you're interested in knives, I mean, it's in the heart of the South. There's there's great food everywhere and drink, by the way. And uh, you know, it, again, it, I don't. If you've never been to the Blade Show, and you might have gone to. Uh, you know, a gun show here and there at the county fairgrounds of, of wherever you live. It, it is, it's 50 times scale larger than that. It's thousands. How many tables do you think you have at that show? It's, it, uh, it's just under a, uh, let's see, I think, what is it? I think it's 700 tables and 200 booths. Yeah, and uh, but we're 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 trying to get that up to a thousand. In fact, I think it's just barely under a thousand. So uh, it, it is just you name it, and 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 it's in there. And of course, we've got the pit there in the hotel where everybody goes to after hours <laughs> to have their favorite beverage, and, uh, and that's talk always a lot it. of fun. Yeah, which is <laughs> funny because you can run into all kinds of knife makers and and collectors, and they're all sitting around. And I, I'm I'm willing to bet that there's been a ton of knives uh, designed on napkins. <laughs> I've always heard that, yes. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that does happen. I, I know it has. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've experienced that. Yeah, cool. I've been there, done that. Uh, but it's a hey, lot of fun. before I forget, there was one mm -hmm. thing I wanted to mention. I, I, I know that you had said, uh, well, anyhow, uh, one thing since we had been, you know, we were purchased this past uh June by Gun Digest Media LLC bought uh, both Blade Magazine and the Blade Show, mm -hmm. and one of our major emphases has been, uh, or one of the new major emphases company is social media, and mm -hmm. we have Melissa Miller uh, of uh, Naked and Afraid fame who is traveling nationwide, uh, visiting the in a trader. She's got a trader and a camera crew. And they're going to knife shops of such knife makers as Jerry Fisk, Brian mm -hmm. Tomberlin, uh, Jim Kroll, and uh, on Instagram, at, mm -hmm. and it's at Blade Ma or what is it at Blade underscore Magazine on Instagram. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wanted to encourage everybody to uh, check Melissa out. She's big. She's they're showing her how to make knives, and she's really uh embraced this and, mm -hmm. and i wanted to make sure everybody knew about that uh because she's she's really uh i think it's going to be a great thing for the oh that's cool knives and and people checking it out just that many the more people we can get into this the better so that's oh, for the God way sakes. we're looking at it well you know again it comes back to blade magazine and the enthusiasm that you guys have shown over the years because you know like I said, I'd have a whole garage full of knives, <laughs> unless people knew that I, that you know that people collected them and that people could see them and all that. And now you guys are going in into uh, that social media, the the uh, the internet uh, era, I guess, and uh, you can reach even further. Uh, I mean, Blade had a had a great circulation uh, and uh, brought a lot of people to the table, but now you guys are reaching out. Uh, I mean, you got a big. Uh, uh, presence on the internet and uh that can only help uh our craft the the knife makers and i want to thank you guys for again you know staying out in front on all, all that and getting more of those people through the doors at the at the knife shows well you're most welcome and uh one more thing i, I guess i should mention is we've re uh, or started our blade show west back up again which is mm -hmm. in portland oregon and it will be November 1st through the 3rd 
uh, next year at the Oregon uh, Convention Center. We had it this past October, and it was a really nice uh, reception for it. A lot of people uh, mm-hmm. were happy to see us back and wanted to, you know, said, said that area needed a new knife show. So well, hopefully we excellent. can kind of, you know, we can spread some of the Blade Show fun out that way. Well, that's cool. Uh, you know, I, I've I'm just so busy that, uh, and and I'm reaching that point in my career where I've got a lot of a lot of commitments going in different directions than that. Uh, don't get me wrong, I'm still making still making a heck of a lot of knives, but uh, I, I just don't have time to go to the. Sh- I've had to cut back on some of the shows. So, oh yeah, uh, I understand. You know, the Blade Show is one we'll never never not be a part of, uh, but. Uh, I should get up there and check out that show in Oregon because, again, when you guys put a, put on a show, you put on a pretty damn nice uh, uh, production, and and it's, you know, for people that are out here, they should get up to that uh, that Portland show. And, and it's funny because up there in Oregon, uh, you know, is that's like one of those. It's like Solingen, Germany, almost uh, for America. There's there's a whole bunch of knife companies up there. Yes, definitely. <laughs> I mean, Benchmade and uh, Kershaw and a whole bunch of the. You know, big yep, players. Yeah, CRKT, all of them. Yeah. It's, uh, it's a lot of Leatherman. It's yeah. It's uh, big time Gerber. Oh yeah. Oh, it's funny. Uh, when I I was actually going to move to Oregon a long, 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 long time ago. Before I was uh, when I was just making those those fancy knives that that you mentioned uh, uh, earlier in the show, mm-hmm. and uh, it was funny because I went to Gerber. Uh, I mean, I was applying everywhere at machine shops and, and things like that just to be a machinist and get a job and move to Oregon. And I thought, well, I might as well go over to Gerber and, and put my, my employment, you know, or, you know, application in over there. And they weren't hiring. And, uh, but it was funny because about, you know, 15 years later, I was doing a design for Gerber. And I said, you know, I, I actually came and applied for a job at your company. <laughs> and they said, oh, man, I wonder if we still have that application. That would be something very cool to put up on our on our wall. <laughs> oh, I said, yeah, well, you didn't hire me, so. <laughs> I forgot. I don't remember. What was the design you did for them? I don't. I can't, it was I can't the, bring that one to mind. I think it's called the Alliance. It's the uh, automatic. Oh, uh, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. I know what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, and uh, you know another good, another good company. Uh, I, I've been very blessed uh, to work with some of the of the finest companies that are out there too, and it's it's been a it's been a treat. So again, you know, Steve, who would have thought knives? I mean, for gosh sakes, you know you mm, exactly. I, you're talking about. Uh, I know uh, that it has put you in contact with uh, outside of the knife community i know it's put you in contact with celebrities and politicians and all kinds of stuff like that and who would ever thought that that knives would be that common denominator yeah it's it's amazing and I, what gets me too is uh just the fact that just the stories that uh, you know that are generated constantly and i one of the main things i tell people this all the time that i have people come up to me and they go how do you come up with ideas for you know a magazine every month and it's always my stock answer is the problem is not coming up with them it's deciding which ones not to put in because there's so many (laughs) well that's not a bad problem (laughs) because i know a lot of magazines are scrambling to get uh content which you know that's very cool and you guys are, you know, you're still out there. You're doing it, uh, you know, every day of the week, getting all those. Uh, and I love to see the new knife makers in the magazine. I mean, I love, believe me, I love to see uh, the the uh, the mention and the articles about the the guys that have been in the game for a long time and and all that too. But it's it's fun to see the young guys because, uh, you know, that there wouldn't be young guys unless this was a thriving industry, uh, and. There's just something about, you know, making something, turning it from a uh, an idea into a piece of, uh, into a drawing on a piece of paper, and then into a piece of steel and 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 handle material and and bone or whatever it is that you use, and then at some point seeing your picture with that knife in Blade magazine. I mean, that that's still a journey that can't. Uh, every young knife maker still wants to be in Blade Magazine. I guarantee you that. 
Yeah, that's that's a great. I think I think you're I think you're right. I think a lot of people. I know still, I'm right on that one. <laughs> I still I still get a thrill seeing my name in print. Just seeing my name on there, looking on. In fact, I remember mom. My mom, she would go up to the old Acorn Knife Shop in Gatlinburg, and she said she'd every time her and dad would go up there on their fall vacation, she would go in there just to pick up Bloody Magazine, pull it out, and. That's Open my it up son. and look for my name and, and find somebody and say, that's my son who's the editor of Blade. <laughs> well, that's a mom for you. That's for damn sure. Yep, exactly. That's pretty cool. <laughs> so uh, let me ask you, do you remember the very first article that you wrote for Blade by chance? You remember oh, what golly. it was? Oh, uh, what? It shouldn't be that. Well, of course, the first one would have been I did a, like an intro Mm-hmm. Of uh, I can pull. Wait a minute, let me pull out a binder right here. Because <laughs> the let's see here. I don't want to put you on the, the first spot. issue <laughs> that I worked on was the let's see the October issue. Believe it or not, October nineteen eighty five, and the cover. Guess it, what knife was on the cover, or it, what make the maker of what knife was on the cover? I guess I should. That wouldn't say. have been Jimmy Lyle, was it? No, but it's close. Loveless. Oh, I'll be darned. Bob Lowe's. Yeah, but it, it was the cover to the uh, his How to Make Knives book. And oh. we used it as, as the cover for that issue. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> let's see here. Wait a minute, I've got that book, and that, that's another one of those that's got the, all the worn-out corners on the, on the pages. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, well, you know, there goes I Bob again. That, yeah, that was the first one my, that I worked on. But, well... The first one I see a byline on was called uh, Skagel Knives, Reflections of the Man, Steve well, Shackelford. Yeah. And that's another so iconic I, name in, yeah. the, in the knife world. Most definitely. So yeah. it, uh, in fact, I screwed that story up so bad that one of the, the guys that I'd gotten <laughs> the information from came to the office and just ran me over the coals. Oh, my God. And so I, I, got, a, I got the uh, uh, right up close and personal uh, how passionate people feel about knives from that fella and which you know i didn't mind because i i needed to be called on stuff Mm -hmm. that i had gotten wrong and uh and that was one thing that i've always liked about this business is people feel so strongly about it that they will you know point out anything you do wrong so uh, anybody who comes into the business even knife makers other knife makers will come up to them and say hey you need to you know Get that sharp corner off that Roger handle that. or whatever, yep. and that, and that's you it know just pushes and, it and along. That's one of the, yeah, it yeah. just everybody helps each other, and uh, and that was one of the reasons Bruce hired me in the first place. Like we were talking about when I worked at the Catoosa County News, I mm-hmm. he said the knife industry was like a a community. You you uh, will talk to the same people over and over again, so you better not hack anybody off because you're going to have to you're going to have to deal with them again. <laughs> They're and not going anywhere. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And that's something I've uh, I've learned. Of course, over time, as I'm, I'm sure you have found out too, there's so much uh, in this industry. That, I'm sorry, uh, Steve. Also, you cut out. There, there's so much what son? I'm turn sorry. turnover among oh, yeah. uh, employees at different places. So. Yeah. You know, you find your no, that's who you are anymore, and uh, you're going well. You know what's what's going on with this knife or whatever. And whereas you, there's still a lot of people that you know that hang around. There at the same time, there's a lot of turnover. So, oh yeah, it's kind of a you know, a double edged sword. Well, you've been there, you've been there for decades. I mean, I, I not to bum you out or anything, but uh, you know. No, no, you know, it just it just dawned on me while we were talking here. This is this is my thirty three thirty third year Holy in the, with the magazine. I'm sixty five, so I've been yeah. long. I've been with the magazine longer than I my life before it was without the magazine. Dang man, that puts it that into perspective. And who would have thought you'd ever pick something? Uh, that you'd stick out for thirty three years. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I never I never thought that I would be with the magazine that long, but Well you Steve know, just You know, here's what I'm gonna say. I, I hope you're around doing yeah, knives yeah, in the yeah. magazine for the next thirty three years also. 
the island in Knoxville, and he goes, I'll make you rich in this business. And I kind of looked at him, I was going, no, I don't think so. But uh, <laughs> actually, he didn't make me rich in money, but I have been rich in the people I've met, friends I've made, and, uh, and, and just the enjoyment of doing yeah. doing what I do. Well, that's that's what life is all about. I mean, you got to, you, you know, you, you try and do good work, and, and I don't mean good quality work. I mean good work as a human being and uh and make friends and hope that those ripples go forth and uh i was saying uh i was kind of talking over you there sorry steve but uh, i was saying you know you've been at it 33 years i I hope you're around for the next 33 years and still uh (laughs) still doing your good work which you know we we certainly appreciate and i'm sure all the knife makers uh and the collectors uh appreciate as well so i just wanted to thank you guys uh uh at Blade, I want to thank you and, and all the people that were before you. Maybe we'll talk to Bruce sometime too. That'd be that'd be a fun. That, I would highly recommend that yeah. because he has he's forgotten more about knives than than most people know. <laughs> well, we'll find out. <laughs> yeah, I'll get a hold of him. That that'd be a good interview. So, again, uh, from from me and and the entire knife making community, if I can speak for him uh, in this regard. Uh, thank you, Steve. Thank you to Blade. Uh, thank you to, for the Blade Show. Uh, it's 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 made me able to do the things that I love to do uh, for thirty some years too. So uh, I guess that about wraps it up, Steve. We could we could talk for the next. Uh, and I'll tell you what, people, if you if you've never been to that Blade Show. Uh, you might think that Steve and I sit around and drink beer and talk about all this. I see you for maybe two seconds <laughs> as you run by waving at me. <laughs> yeah. This is true. Yeah, this is so true. this has been a real treat, Steve. I, I truly appreciate it. Thank you for taking all the time. I know you're busy. Uh, you got all that stuff going on. And Thanks for coming on the show today. I really, really enjoyed the talk. Thanks for having me, Ernie. All righty, Steve. Well, I guess that about wraps it up for today's show, Danny. Uh, All right, very good. Let's sign out. All right. Bye-bye, Steve. Bye, Steve. See you, Ernie. See you, Danny. I wanted to thank our sponsors today, uh, Hoist Gracie uh, Jiu-Jitsu South Bay. uh, And uh, they're formed at uh, Hoist Gracie South Bay, uh, Hoist Gracie Jiu-Jitsu South Bay dot com. Yeah. And uh, also uh, uh, the Order of the Black Shamrock, found at uh, orderoftheblackshamrock.com. And uh, you can uh, subscribe to the podcast. Uh, you can uh, find us on all the podcast apps, Twitters and Instagrams and Stitchers and all that good stuff. So we're, we're out there. And, uh, you know, I just wanted to uh, be sure that uh, we all take time to to thank all the people that make our wonderful lives possible. And uh, so I want to just say, hey, you know what? It's time to uh, think every once in a while uh, in your busy day. Uh, take the time to, uh, to think about. And, and, and if you meet any of these people in person, to, to put your hand out and, and thank them and tell them how much you appreciate uh, what they're doing. And those people are the, uh, the soldiers, uh, the sailors, the airmen, the Marines, Coasties, uh, all of the people that uh, wear the uniform or the badge, uh, including all of our first responders. Uh, you know, those people are out there every day doing uh, the, the dirty work that uh, keep us safe and putting their lives and, and their futures on the line. And uh, we owe them everything. Uh, you know, our ability to have uh, uh, the greatest nation that uh, has ever existed on this planet is a result of the efforts of those people, the, the sacrifices that they've made and are, and are still going to be making for us. And it's because of their efforts that uh, all of us can uh, sleep soundly uh, in our beds at night. And uh, we thank all of you and are eternally grateful for your service and uh, all the things that you do for us. And uh, on that note, Danny, I think it's time to say goodbye. Very good. Signing out.